Welcome. The Professional Development Collaborative for the Social Studies Standards took a brief recess for the holidays, but we're back now and looking forward to continuing our deeper dives into what exactly has changed with specific content in the revised Michigan Social Studies Standards. We are on the road this month. We are at Frederick B. Pankow Center. The TV broadcast media class uh, has graciously welcomed us in to record in their studio today, so we are very much appreciative of their help getting this month's video put together. Today, I'm interviewing Derek D'Angelo. Uh, he is a teacher from Utica Public Schools, but he is also the president of the Michigan Council on Economic Education. He's here to talk today a little bit about what's changed with economics in the revised standards. Derek, thanks for being here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the council and what you guys do? Well, the Michigan Council on Economic Education is a nonprofit entity. We're here to help the students and the teachers uh, make sure that they have what they need to be successful in teaching and learning economics. And we work with teachers from K through 12 to make sure that they know what they need to teach and, and have those tools. So tell us a little bit about what exactly did change in high school economics. Well, the good news is not much. The content that was there before is still there now. We had to add a couple of things, but really three categories is how we would say that things changed with the revised standards. And I think it will impact learning in the classroom. Uh, the first one would be language. We cleaned up some terminology and made sure that the students are focusing more on higher order thinking skills. It's not just uh, more of a memorization. Uh, the next thing would be consolidation of some standards. So sometimes when there's so many standards, things get lost. It, it seems overwhelming to the teacher um, and also to the learner. So to consolidate things and, and make there be less overall standards, I think helps clarity for learning. And then also, um, just a couple of additions where in the previous standards, because it was the first ever standards for economics, the last time we did the standards, um, as it became a required course in Michigan, uh, there were a couple of topics that we thought weren't as clearly represented as they should be, and we added them into the new standards for um, this version. So I wanted to break it down a little bit into some of those categories. If, as we get onto the language examples, um, for instance, there was a standard 1.1.2 about entrepreneurship, and, and it just said identify the risks. And identify is, is great, but you're just doing more of a listing. So now we're having the students analyze the risks and the rewards. So they're looking not just at the, the good or the, the bad, they're, they're analyzing and looking at, at those things and making a judgment. And, and that's what I think a lot of the things we did in the standards do. Um, another one was 2.2.1 uh, with the federal government and macroeconomic goals. Another identify. So it's, again, more of a list that they were doing before, whereas now they're evaluating. So we don't, we're not telling students what to think. It's evaluate and make that judgment for yourself when you've looked at, at both sides of, of, a, of, a, of an issue. So um, they're able to, to judge that for themselves. So that would be some of the language examples that, that changed. When we get into the consolidation, uh, we had a, a standard 1.3.1, uh, which was the law of supply. And then we had one that followed it, which was the law of demand. So it was very simple to just combine both of those um, into the new 1.3.1, where it's supply and demand, and, and also you know, work on that terminology a little bit so they're using it, not just kind of knowing the law of supply or the law of demand. Um, and then uh, economic indicators, because we had all the basic economic indicators in a different standard. So 2.1.2 um, on economic indicators. Now they're using a number of indicators, GDP, GDP per capita, unemployment rates, inflation. Um, instead of being separated, they're all consolidated into one standard. So again, we're not losing content. It's just consolidation of that. Um, and, they're, and they're analyzing, too, as they're looking at the economic indicators that are not just looking or reporting on those economic indicators that are they're able to synthesize and bring those things all together to judge, okay, where is the economy? How is it doing? Okay. And then the last category of, of basic changes uh, would be on some additions, just some, some things we wanted to add, uh, for instance, on the 1.1.1 standard of scarcity, choice, opportunity, cost, comparative advantage. This is where usually a class begins. They're, they're talking about an economic way of thinking. They're, uh, it's a decision-making model type of uh, time when they're looking at that. And now we add an incentives into that discussion because 
almost everything we do is based upon incentives, whether they're financial or non-financial. We wanted to make sure that we clearly had incentives in that economic way of thinking part of the discussion at the start of the course. And um, one other one that was added uh, would have been our marginal analysis, um, weighing the benefits and the cost of actions. So I don't know, did you hit the uh, snooze button this morning, Dave, on the alarm? Once or twice. Once or twice, okay. But each time you did that, you were using an economic way of thinking. You were thinking, okay, what's the cost of me hitting the snooze button? What's the benefit? And obviously the benefit outweighed the cost, and that's why you did it. So we wanted to make sure that the kids had the opportunity to go through that type of analysis um, and weigh the cost and the benefits. Um, you know, I was looking at uh, tickets to a concert the other day, and I, I noticed that if I you know, sat in row 20, it was $35. And if I moved back 10 rows, it was going to be 15 less dollars. And I'm like, OK, well, I think I'll do that. I think I'll move back. So it, and the kids are not being told what to do. They're, they're evaluating and using this, this uh, way of thinking to make their decisions. So that would be, I guess, the three categories of things that change the most. And then additionally, I want to talk about personal finance. Yes, please. Because, I mean, that's so important. Uh, and it, it's where the, and a lot of the economics becomes real to the student, where they're dealing with things every single day. Um, and it, our old personal finance standards didn't really give a clear direction to teachers of what they needed to teach um, and what the, what the outcome was that the students needed to learn. So now we have six very clear areas that we want the students to learn about. And the first one, 4.1.1, is about earning income. So in that way, it gives the teacher an opportunity to teach about careers mm -hmm. and college and trade schools and all the different opportunities that are out there for earning income. Sure. And then also how to use that income because that, that income is their wealth building tool. You know, so we want to make sure that they, they have a lot of um, instruction on the earning income. Uh, 4.1.2 is on buying goods and services and we want obviously our students to be good consumers. And so we want them to be able to budget and use those things that they learned in the marginal analysis parts earlier, but now applying it to their personal life, right? So it's, it's taking basically everything that they learned earlier in the course um, in the standards that you see um, and applying it to their personal life with the budgeting and things. And then 4.1.3 is on saving. And saving, uh, when to save, how to save. Um, I know when I was younger, I, I thought, okay, saving was whatever was left after I paid all my monthly bills, right? But I still feel that way, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, want them to, we want them to be taught to, to save first and make sure that they make that a priority. And in the different ways that might look, especially as uh, the financial world is changing with all the electronic payment systems and everything else we have now. So uh, we want to equip them with those, those tools. And 4.1.4 is on using credit and uh, credit scores. You know, you need to know the rules of the game if you want to be successful at the game. Yep. So we want them to understand what makes up their FICO score, what is most important for them to do, and, and how these choices of going and signing up for a new credit card might impact them negatively or positively. And then uh, 4.1.5 on financial investing. Um, really, this is the exciting part for me as a teacher. I, I love teaching the investing part. It's like, okay, if you save and you do it over a long period of time, how is that money going to grow? And to, to watch the compound interest and the returns that they'll get um, is amazing. And that, that's what really hooks a lot of kids when, when they see, like, really? Like, I can become a millionaire if I just do this? It's like, well, it's going to take some time. It's not the lottery, you know? Right. But, but it's, um, it's something that, that once they know and you give them that knowledge, then they can make, take the steps that they need to, to be successful in that way. And the last one would be uh, 4.1.6 on protecting and insuring. And this is, you know, a, a person's got to determine if they want to accept the risk, which sometimes we do. I, I know that sometimes when I buy something, they ask me if I want to buy the warranty at the, at the cash register at the checkout. Mm -hmm. You know, do a quick analysis in my head, like, okay, if this breaks, can I afford to replace it myself? Or is this something that I want to pay to transfer that risk to somebody else? Um, and so they're going to be doing that analysis um, during that last part of the personal finance. So there's, I'm excited about it. I mean, it's exciting to, to think and see how all of those things that you're teaching in the earlier standards in economics kind of come to that life application in personal finance. And it doesn't need to be taught as a, a specific section. Again, the, the teachers have the freedom. It can be interwoven through the entire course as you're teaching 
um, all the economic standards throughout the, the semester. And that's really important stuff to equip kids in high school who are preparing to go out into the real world, you know, whether it's one year, two, or three, that's really important to equip them with those tools. So Absolutely. It's great to hear. Uh, we've talked so far primarily about the high school economics. Uh, what are some things that have changed in terms of economic topics in some of the earlier grades? Yes, and, and this is, um, you know, I've got some kids that are in elementary school and they always come home and they're so excited when they are learning about economics and, and what dad does. And, and so I, I have a passion for the elementary and what they're, what they're doing as well, not just that uh, high school course. Um, and at the earlier grades, um, kindergarten and first grade, a lot of times it's identifying needs and wants. And, you know, rather than just identifying those, what we want to move toward is a prioritization of those. Um, you know, I, I think we all pretty much understand what we need to survive. Um, but, you know, what I view as a need, like, I need my cell phone. I don't know if you need your cell phone. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it's like I don't need a cell phone to survive, but I'm going to talk and I'm going to say, oh, you know, I need a cell phone to do what I do in my situation. But, you know, and I need a car in my situation. But if I lived in, in, in a city that had public transportation or I lived near where I needed to go, maybe I don't need a car. So that, that's really going to change based upon the individual situation. And so at the elementary level, at those beginning levels where mm -hmm. I think it's so important that they learn this, these things, um, we have them doing that prioritization and learning that one person's needs might be different than another person's needs. Um, and that, get, that also gives the flexibility so across the state you're not being told, okay, this is what you need to learn and it's this box of knowledge that gets passed around, but rather it's flexible and adapts to the community. Uh, and so I, I really like that about some of the stuff in the early elementary. Um, and in grade two, uh, some of the basic terminology, just like we talked about the high school course, we're going from um, identifying a business which some of the, the standards, they're already, it's inherent in the standard. They're going to identify a business. Now we're going to have them uh, describe how that business meets consumer wants, you know, how that business works, rather than just identifying a business in the local community. So that was uh, something that was in the, the grade two that was a bit of a change. And uh, in grade three, we added the role of entrepreneurship. Um, these are our job creators, right? These are. Um, a dynamic economy has got to have entrepreneurship. So we want to make sure the students understand that. And, and again, they're, they're um, explaining. They're not just stating and listing things. Um, they're, they're, they're explaining how things happen, uh, whether it, it's entrepreneurship or whether it's um, the specialization that you get with entrepreneurs where they focus on a certain uh, task or a certain job um, and how they're going to serve the community. In grade four, uh, there's this, is, this was a, a couple of big changes in, in grade four, whereas they were before in standard 1.0.1, .1, um, they were just listing three economic questions. And, and it's like, okay, these are three economic questions. You can memorize these things. People can look them up very easily. There wasn't much that, of value add from just identifying what these three questions were. So now they're applying those three questions. They're applying the basic economic questions and looking at situations in their community and identifying um, how it's applying to their life in those, in those situations. The other thing that um, people are passionate about one way or another is the circular flow model. I know a lot of fourth grade teachers who were very uh, interested to see what exactly happened with that, so tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we teach the circular flow model in, in the high school course, so it's not like it's going away, but we are pulling it back um, as part of the wording in the standards for grade four. So the way the standards are worded now, if the teacher likes the circular flow model as a way to teach this concept, they can use it. It's a tool. You know, that's what the circular flow model is. The purpose was never to teach the circular flow model. The purpose was to show students how um, goods and services um, are, are provided and exchanged for money um, in the product market and in the factor of production market. So that's the standard and that's the way we wrote the standard focused on that. So if you want to teach it using a circular flow model, feel free. If you want to use um, a different ways of teaching that, that's fine as well. So I think that makes everybody happy. <laughs> yeah. um, and so also in fourth grade on the international stage, because they're, 
they're growing their their look at things as as they get older. They're not just looking at their local community, but expanding their their worldview. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at the international stage in fourth grade as well. And again, some terminology changes there. They're not just um, describing how global competition affects the economy, um, but identifying the advantages and disadvantages. And when they start to do that at a young age, they're identifying the advantages and disadvantages. Now you're setting them up to be able to, you know have their own judgments on how they feel um, we are interacting with the rest of the world economy and, and what the role of the United States should be in that economy. It's not a dictated, it's an analysis that they're able to do because of the way that standards are written. So I think it really helps direct the learning in, in the right way for students to evaluate um, what's going on and it will be flexible as things change as well. Sounds like some really good changes in the uh, elementary grades in particular. Yes. So you were with us on the writing team through a good chunk of the five-year process that we went through. Yes. Um, and part of uh, part of that process was uh, getting lots of outside groups to kind of take a look at things and make some suggestions on how we can make them better, more inclusive. So all of the teams really worked with some outside groups to ensure that uh, the standards were as inclusive as they could possibly be. Tell us a little bit about what that looked like in, for economics. You know, I, I think when you, you worry about that at first, you're like, oh, People are going to be looking over my shoulder. How, how is this going to come through? Yep. And what I've always found is that people are going to give good advice. And when you bring those other voices in, you get a better product. And sometimes you don't even realize how it could become better. And that's how I always felt at every stage when we brought a new group of people in to look at it in fresh perspectives. Even if it was just one word change, you were like, oh my goodness, that is going to be amazing. That's an amazing change. Like, I see it. Yep. Um, and, and it's something that no matter how many hours I spent looking at these things and other people spent looking at these things, it just didn't come up in that dynamic discussion. And so the more voices that we had at the table, I think it, we improved every single layer of those five years. It was a long process, but I think we got a better product because of it. And, and for economics, you know, we came through uh, the bias review committee that looked at it and, and we gave them a good product and they didn't have any changes for us because we really went through uh, that process in that five years very intentionally to make sure that it was inclusive and that we weren't telling anybody what to think, but rather giving them the tools and ability to be able to make those decisions and, and figure it out themselves. So, uh, you know, we're, we're all members of the economics party. Um, it's, it's not Republican, it's not Democrat. We're just going to focus on those most efficient use of resources and using logical decision making. And it's, it's necessary for everybody and it, it's not, um, everything's being looked at through an economic lens. So on that note, um, you know, one of the questions that I've asked everyone that I've interviewed in this series is how they envision teachers practicing inquiry in the field under study that particular month. So how do you envision inquiry-based education in an economics classroom? Well, you know, I think that economics is perfect for inquiry um, because we don't want to have these students just looking up A, B, and C. They can get that on their cell phones um, at the older ages. Uh, so it's about making sure that they know what to do with that information, with that knowledge. And when I talked about we added marginal analysis, you know, you can see a little bit of where that inquiry is going to happen, where they're going to be weighing the costs and the benefits and deciding, you know, what to do. I've got a, a banner up in my room that says, think like an economist today. You know, and in every decision, I want them to think like economists, my students. I want them to um, not just do it with their money, because it isn't always about money. Sometimes it's about their time or any decision they have to make. Uh, there's, you can't order everything on the menu. You've got to make a choice, right? So which one's going to bring me the most happiness? And you know, we, so we should look at where do researchers say we, bring, we get the most happiness from, and where should we be spending our money where it's going to bring us the most happiness, right? We, we don't have another chance to spend that dollar got one chance to spend it. You want to be wise in how you spend it. So we're making sure that they have that economic way of thinking, um, that they're weighing the costs and benefits. I, I've got a friend who on his Twitter profile uh, puts that he likes to go for long walks on the beach until the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefit and then he stops. <laughs> and, and at first I looked at that and I was just, that's an odd thing to put on your Twitter profile. <laughs> but, but it made sense to me. The more I thought about it, I was like, that's what we do with everything. We do things until the cost is greater than the benefit, and then we stop. Like, you know, with eating pizza, how many slices are you going to eat? I'm going to keep going until the benefit's greater than the cost, and I'm going to stop. And so we're trying to make sure that they realize and apply 
that way of thinking to whatever they're doing, whatever decision it is in life. And, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be with money. It's anything that they've got to make choices on because of scarcity, because there was only so much of it. Um, you know, time is probably more important than money. I, I don't know, would you, I, I've got a question for you. Would you change places with Warren Buffett, meaning you would go to be 87 years old right now, and you would have $88 billion, but you'd lose the next 40 years of life. And I know you've got young kids, mm -hmm. so I want to know, would you change places with Warren Buffett? Right now, you'd be 87 years old, 88 years old, with, with $88 billion. Would you do that? The money would sure be nice, but I sure do love my family. So uh, the, the time, what I heard you just say there, the time piece, I don't know, is necessarily worth that much to me. Right, so, so you're, what you're saying is your time, your next 40 years is worth more than $88 billion. I won't make that much, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it is in your decision making, right? So we want students to realize that that time is their most important resource and, and make sure that they make their choices wisely and that they analyze all those costs and benefits and, and make good choices so they don't have regrets and they feel positively about what they've done with their time, with their money, with anything. So I think that this inquiry um, will be exciting to see happen in economics and, and to, to give these standards to teachers and, and let them run with it and see what, what they do in the classroom will be amazing. Well, Derek, uh, I want to thank you again for being here, for making time to come out and help film this video. Absolutely. Um, and teachers of the state, go out and check out the Michigan Council on Economic Education. If you're looking for resources, if you're looking for anything econ related, uh, that's going to be your place to go. And again, really appreciate your time here today. Uh, and I want to thank the Frederick V. Pankow Center's TV and broadcast media class once again for hosting us today. We will be back again next month on the road again from U of M Flint as we begin to explore what exactly changed in K4. Thanks again so much for your time. Thank you, Dave.